भगवान श्री योगी राम सूरत कुमार की जाए सर्वों योगी राम सूरत कुमार पढ़वत After one hour of Bhagwan's powerful Namas and Kirtan, we have offered them at the lotus feet of Bhagwan with grateful pranams. Before we start our everyday Leela of Man, a word about our Nandini, the beginning of the ashram, Sri Natarajan donated a cow which was called by Bhagwan Sita. And Sita did her beautiful service to Bhagwan all through. And in the year 2000, I think, after four bulls, she gave finally birth to a female cow. At the time, Bhagwan used to make us read an article on Bharadwaj Ashram, and we came across this name, Nandini, the great giver, Kamadenu's daughter, Nandini, was also a wish-fulfilling cow. So with Bhagwan's permission, I began to call this Nandini. Nandini also, all these 23 years, has served very well, though of course she could not yield a calf because of something that she went through. But she had, she was divine every bit. When she was taken away to a nearby village for breeding, she was crying, but then we thought it was good for her. And she stayed on for nearly a year there. And the man who took the cow later on reported when he returned the cow at our insistence. He said, it's a very divine cow. After it came into the village, the whole village started to flourish. And the one who took this cow, Nandini, to his village, he was in utter, abject poverty. But after Nandini landed in his house, he has begun to pick up. He was selling milk. Now that started to flourish. He bought cow after cow after cow and accumulated quite a bit of wealth. And then he reached a stage where 
he began to go in an auto all round, selling milk. Not only he, the whole village flourished. So they were very sad to part with Nandini, but we could not afford to leave Nandini outside anymore. Just because of her presence in the ashram, there must have been many, many benefits. She's a great giver, and we have no idea in how many ways the ashram flourished too by her presence. She's a holy soul. She left her body on the Ekadasi day a highly auspicious day for a departing soul. It is in remembrance of Nandini, a great soul who served her master very well, that we pay this obeisance to her and our Anantakoti pranams to her was attained the lotus feet of Bhagwan. There was no disease. Even after she left the body, the body looked fresh. She looked as though she had fallen asleep. Such is the glory of our Nandini. We owe it to her to remember. Only day before yesterday, she left her body. Our pranams and pranams to great, the great Nandini. Now, for this day, we shall go through some experiences which will benefit us spiritually. Now, to begin with, we will turn to Shivili Vakam Srinivasan. He has written something very interesting in one of his articles, and I happen to read today. He says in his article, the beginning of his coming to Sanadhi Street House, he would write many letters. And in one of the letters he wrote, he had no money to come all the way to Tiruvannamalai. Whenever he had money, he would make a visit to Bhagwan for his darshan. Soon after that, somehow, everything changed, money began to flow. He was an astrologer, predicting things for people, and people began to offer money to him, saying that this knowledge of prediction should not be taken away from him without Dakshina. So you see, for the next two months, money kept flowing. But then, to his great dismay, he found that he could not go, he could not go to visit Bhagwan at Tirumannamalai. He began to wonder how it could possibly happen. He had returned to Bhagwan to say that when he had money, he would make the visit for the darshan. And now there was enough and more money, but he still could not go there. What was it all about? He could not sleep thinking about it. For two months he had kept himself away from Tiruvannamalai. 
How was it possible? And suddenly it flashed. He had returned, he had no money, and when he got money he would come. He had no money, Bhagawan granted it. But his visit to Bhagawan is purely by his grace, by his sankalpa. It's only if only Bhagawan willed, people could visit him. Otherwise, it's not possible. As soon as this truth surfaced in his consciousness, he understood what a fool he had been to assume that it was money that made it possible. Our Bhagawan often said to me and to others, when this ashram was being built, without his calling anybody, people could not even step into the ashram. If he wanted to give a specific grace to someone, he would call out, and that is when the idea to come, the prompting to come to the ashram, would come to those people. Now when I read about this interesting incident of Shivilivakum Srinivasan's observation. I thought, how fitting. I often tell people, people who come here the first time or all of a sudden, even the old devotees, they say, we don't know how we made it. All of a sudden the idea came and we find ourselves here. And then I would tell them that Bhagwan had said so unless he called people to give some specific grace, people could not even step into the ashram. What a demonstration in the case of Sri Srinivasan. In 2011, during some festival here, I don't remember if it was Jayanti or Aradhana, probably Jayanti, Sri Desa Mankair Karasi had come to give a speech. She is the disciple of Sri Kapananda Varya. She has received His grace in full measure she is an excellent speaker. When she came here, she told us very, uh, quite a few interesting stories, which were very instructive and informative. One of them was, she said, it is God who comes down in the form of the Guru, in the form of Dakshinamurti, in the form of our Guru, Divine Guru. And she said the greater truths of life, the higher truths of life can come to us only through a realized Guru, a high-souled Guru. She said, once there was a student of a great master, after some attendance in the school, he found out that whatever the Guru was teaching was already known to him. He had read many books. There was nothing that he could not find in one of those books that his Guru spoke. So soon he decided egoistically that he did not need a guru at all, that he could learn everything by himself. And he left the guru, he had the audacity to leave the guru. The guru didn't say anything, he just smiled and kept quiet. 
one day when he was studying one of the books he came across three strange things it was stated there the left over what we call vichishtam in sanskrit we generally the left over food of anybody the left over drink of anybody is considered unfit for god but here was a statement the left over this particular left over is considered as holy and fit for god he did not say the left over of what who and then the next sentence is the vomit is considered as holy just think the vomit the very thought of vomit will bring out vomit from us now here was a statement a very strange statement which said the vomit of something or someone is considered as holy and fitting for god and the third statement equally strange was after the death of this being the clothes on this being is considered as holy and fit for god so now all the three sentences were very strange curious he tried and tried and tried to understand to get an insight into the meaning of these three statements it says the left over food of a being is considered as fitting and holy the vomit of a being is considered as fitting and holy and the third was the cloth that covered the dead being is considered as holy and fitting for god so he started to scrutinize the statements as well as wherever he went wherever people throw wherever people threw the leaf in which the food was taken he would go on stare at the banana leaf which served as a plate for food thinking that if he just looked at it penetratingly if he concentrated on it he would know the meaning that the left over food of a being is holy and fitting for god but no matter how many places he visited how much he curiously scrutinized the fallen leaves he could not get the meaning at all and that is when he got tired he was as flabbergasted he didn't know what to do and suddenly the thought of his guru came to him the thought the here is something that i cannot understand even though i found in a book i could not follow the meaning probably had i stayed on with my guru my guru is a great master he would have explained it to me i would have known the meaning from him the minute he thought this the minute his contemplation brought him to this thought of his guru suddenly an old man appeared on the spot he was just coming this student was looking at those banana leaves there was some function there in a house 
And those people were provided with dinner, a sumptuous food, meal, and after that the visitors had thrown all those banana leaves. So here was standing the student, looking at it intensely, not knowing what to make of it. But his contemplation brought him to think of his guru. And the minute the guru's thought came back to him, an old man came out of the house to throw his banana leaf. Now the old man looked at him curiously, mischievously, and said, Young man, you seem to be very educated. Why are you standing here of all the places? Why are you looking at these banana leaves which have been used and thrown? What is the matter? And then this Vidyati, the student, said, Sir, I found these three sentences in a book and there the first of its kind is the leftover food is considered as holy and fitting. So I was just thinking that by looking at these banana leaves and the leftover food on it, I could perhaps get some insight into it. The old man smiled and said, Oh, don't you know, my dear student? Just think, a calf drinks the milk from its mother cow and the leftover milk is taken for anointing the deities in the sanctum sanctorum. Isn't that vichishtam? It's only after the cough that the milk is taken for Abhishekam to Lord Shiva. And then he came to the second statement, the vomit. My dear boy, think of all those brisk bees which are moving about restlessly. What do they do? They go from flower to flower, gather honey, they keep that honey in the mouth. As soon as they reach the beehive, they vomit it out. They bring it out of their mouth. They vomit it. Now this honey is considered as holy and fitting for Abhishekam to Lord Shiva. And then the final statement, he said, the dead body, whenever we visit the house where a dead body is, after that we have a head bath. We call it pollution and then the scriptures say that we must take a head bath. When such is the tradition, how come the clothes taken from the dead body of a being is holy and fitting? He said, my dear boy, the silkworm you must have heard of. It builds, I think they call it cocoon. With, there is a resin there in the mouth and it comes out in the form of a thread. And this thin and strong thread is made into a cocoon and this worm, the silk worm, will get inside. If you have to extract the silk thread from the cocoon, you have to kill the silk worm. The cocoon is like the dress, like the cloth that covers the body of the worm. So they generally kill the worm and take away the silk thread. And the silk, any silk sari, silk dhoti, is considered as blemishless, 
holy and fitting. It's on special occasions they put on the silk clothes on the deity. So as soon as the old man explained all these things, the student realized, oh yes, the minute I thought of the guru, here is someone who looks like my guru, readily gave the explanation for all this. What a fool I am to think that I could get this knowledge without the help of a guru. So he went back to the guru, apologized profusely, and the guru, of course, is an embodiment of kindness, understanding. So he blessed him and allowed him to join. So this story shows the higher truths can be understood only through a guru, a great master. One cannot, even the japa, they say traditionally, the, jap, the nama that is being given by a great master bears an enormous fruit and fast at that. Whereas a nama that has been picked up from a book or from some ordinary person would take a long, long time to benefit the japa doer. So a guru is absolutely necessary, more so if he is a great guru, a great master, master has become one with God. And then I found another interesting story. The great masters, the yogis, the jnanis, they are all like fire. Bhagwan often said the statement, a yogi is like fire, a jnani is like, a f like fire. One should not play with them, one should be careful. One should be subdued, docile in front of a great master. One should not play with them. Now here I found a demonstration in one of her stories that she narrated. We all know on the mountain Arunachaleshwara there is a cave called Guhai Namaschivaya. And there lived two great saints from Karnataka. They lived for so long there, they picked up Tamil and they were composing songs in Tamil in praise of Arunachaleshwara. Now Guru Namaschivaya, a very great popular saint at that time and many, many people used to come to him. Once a herd was looking after the goats. He came crying to this guru saying that he lost the little goat. The goat had died and he was crying, crying, crying so much over that. Guru Namaschiva, out of kindness, took pity on him and said, My little boy, why are you crying? The goat is not dead. And then he just looked at the goat and said, Come on, come over here. And the, the dead goat got up and moved towards him. You can imagine the overwhelming joy of this little boy after he saw the dead goat coming alive. Now naturally this became viral, it, got to, it began to spread everywhere, the whole town of the Thiruvannamalai. Now there were some miscreants, some rowdies who could not believe that, who wanted to make fun of him, were mocking at him. So they wanted to give a test. What they did was, they, one of the 
they made one of them lie down, even as the dead could lie down. They carried him to the great saint, laid him down before him and said, Master, see our friend and relative, he is dead and gone. Please bless him. They pretended. Guru Namah Shivaya. Of course, he knew everything. He was a Trikala Jnani. There was nothing that he did not know. He said he knew that these people were play acting, just to mock at him. He said, Is it? He is dead? So be it. And the man was dead. He could not get up, much to the regret of those friends who played this mischief before this great guru. The story reminded me of Bhagwan's statement that jnanis and yogis are like fire, one should not play with them. Now, the third story that I came across in a speech was equally interesting. Vyasa, everybody knows he wrote Mahabharata. He was a great, great Rishi. His son was Shukha. He was a great soul. Even when he was born, he was 16 years. And he was born as a realized soul, he read all the scriptures, the Upanishads, and there was nothing that he did not read. And what was more, he had the experience of the highest, but then he had a doubt. He wanted somebody to confirm that that was the highest experience and there was nothing more to reach. Vyasa sent his son to Janaka Rishi. At the time, King Janaka was ruling Mithila. He was called, he was considered as Raja Rishi. He was at once a king and a great master, a realized master. So Shuka went to his palace, stood at the gate. When he sent word, Janaka, the king Janaka, wanted to know who had come at the gate. Shuka said, it is Shuka Brahma Maharishi, wanting to see king Janaka. King Janaka, with a smile, a sarcastic smile, said, is it? Please tell him to drop all others and then come. I want only him to come, not others. A very cryptic remark. Of course, the go-between did not understand what King Janaka meant. But when he went there and promptly conveyed what King Janaka said, Shuka, the great soul, immediately understood. He said he was Shuka Brahma Maharishi. So King Janaka wanted only Shuka to come. He wanted Shuka to drop Brahma and Maharishi. The titles, the self-given titles, which meant there was a trace of ego. The realization of the highest truth can come only when even the last trace of ego dies. The individuality, the sense of individuality, the sense of being someone, being something, should completely go. The thought that I am a man or I am a woman, I am in such and such position, all that must go. The Shuka realized that this Brahma and Maharishi titles must go, 
So he simply sent word, Shuka has come. Then King Janaka said, he can come. And as soon as he came, on the way, there would be many, many temptations. King Janaka deliberately kept beautiful women dancing, sumptuous food on the other side, and so many other things which could not be easily escaped from such temptations of Maya. But Shuka did not even glance at them. He went straight to King Janaka and King Janaka immediately put him on the throne and said, Shuka, there is nothing that you do not know. There is nothing you could still reach. You have attained everything. You have attained the greatest state of being. Nothing more to attain. So you see, even at that level, there could be a doubt, there could be a trace of some identity or the other. Even that has to be rid of. So when that is the case, at our level, imagine how much more we have to do to get rid of this ego identity. Now, just as the student learnt, our Bhagwan has taught us to chant the name. In fact, when his sadhu, a mendicant, came to him, Bhagwan asked him, what kind of sadhana are you doing? He said, I'm chanting the name of God and I'm mixing it with my breath. Immediately, pat came the reply from Bhagwan, don't do it. It's enough if you concentrate on the Nama. Just do this Nama Japa, Nama chanting, that will do. That will take you to the highest. Do not complicate it. And Bhagwan had given us his name to chant, to remember. Whatever I had seen many times when Bhagwan had food in a plate or a leaf, the devotees would rush there for some leftover food that included me. We all used to rush for Vichishta, the leftover food from the Master's plate. Now think that any teaching that came from his mouth, do the Nama chanting, that will do, you don't have to complicate it with anything else, and you would reach the highest. That has come from his mouth. Isn't that Vichishtam? Anything that came from his mouth, is the leftover food. So let us eat that, let us absorb that into our system and go on repeating his name. That is all we have to do. That is our uchishta. This uchishta is available to everyone who chants the name because this has come from his mouth from Bhagwan's mouth, it could be considered as the leftover food for our soul. Now, to this Bhagwan, we shall submit our today's prayer, Bhagwan. It is only by your grace the present prevalent situation could be overcome. We beg you again and again with our heart and soul for your immediate divine intervention to free the entire world from the clutches of this dreadful virus 